<clears throat> okay, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jonathan Flint. Uh, Dr. Flint is a uh, professor uh, in residence in psychiatry, biobehavioral sciences at UCLA School of Medicine, senior scientist at the Center for Neurobehavioral Genetics at UCLA. Uh, he moved recently from Oxford University. Uh, he co-directs the Depression Grand Challenge Program with Larry Sapersky and uh, several other investigators. And he addresses the important issue of major depression, which affects over 300 million people worldwide and has uh, made some very important discoveries recently on the genetic basis of major depression, which obviously fits very nicely with the topic of precision neuroscience. So, hey, um, Jonathan, can we have you where this sits much sure. better? Okay, thanks very much. That way you can move around. I don't have to be stuck there. Wave my arms. Stop. You can wave your arms. <laughs> so you just put this around. trying. From the other side? It's going to work. Hold on. Yeah, okay. The color's a bit odd. Okay, thank you very much for having me here. So, uh, I'm going to talk to you um, about a miserable subject, depression. And um, to do so, I'm going to use some of the genetic data that we've collected over the last eight years in a large study that I've carried out long way away from here in China. And uh, I'm not going to describe the uh, details of what we've done. I just want to make one point, which is that you can use genetic data in the way that Mike Friedlander said in order to uh, make precision medicine work in neuroscience. I'm going to start just present presenting the clinical problem we've got, briefly show you what we've done genetically, and then deal with what I think is the critical problem, uh, which is, is depression one disease or many? So let me just start with the clinical issue. So depression is recognized now to be among the world's leading causes of disability and predicted by 2020 to become the top uh, holder of that uh, award. It's not only a uh, disorder uh, causes disability, um, it uh, kills people. So there are 800,000 people per year, that works out. One person every second that kills themselves, and the majority of those do so because they're depressed. So that's just some idea of the degree of the burden this disease imposes upon us. And in this country alone, we spend 245 Milli uh, we prescribe 245 million uh, drugs at a cost of about 10 billion, even though it's well established that only about half of our patients will see improvement. So it's a common disease, it's disabling, we don't treat it very well, and there have been no novel or more effective antidepressants developed in the past 25 years. So that very briefly is why everyone in this room should be studying depression. It is the leading cause of disability in the world, and we really don't do a good job at treating it or understanding what causes it. So I'm now going to deal with what I th think is the reason why it's been so difficult for us to make much progress, and that's to outline to you a couple of pieces of evidence that it's a complex heterogeneous condition. And the way that I would think about this is as follows. If you were to come to me and say you have a, uh, a high fever, a temperature, and I, as your physician, confirm that with a thermometer, yes, you have a high temperature, and then I give you a medicine for that, an antipyretic, and tell you to go away, 
That's not good medicine. I have made no diagnosis, and I've certainly not treated the underlying cause. But in some respects, that's very similar to you coming to me and saying, you're miserable. I say, yes, you have major depressive disorder, and here's an antidepressant. We really don't know what is causing that change in mood, and our treatments currently are symptomatic. So if that's true, then there should be some evidence of heterogeneity. And I want to just show you two pieces of evidence from the literature that is so. The first is genetic. So these are data from two twin studies, work from my colleague Ken Kendler. And what you're seeing on the vertical axis is a measure of heritability. And you can see that there's a difference between males and females. That's significant. These are large samples. But the reason I'm showing this to you is because of the, the bar on the right-hand side, which is the genetic correlation between men and women. If the same genetic risk factors were making men and women depressed, then that should be 100%. And it's not. It's more like 55%. In other words, almost half of the shared genetic contribution uh, between um, men and women uh, is almost half is shared and almost half is non-shared. So at a genetic level, in some, at some level, it is not the same disorder. So that's the genetic evidence that we're dealing with a heterogeneous condition. And I now want to give you one piece of evidence um, from the literature on, envir on the environmental causes of depression. So I think we're all familiar with the fact that if something bad happens to us, so for scientists that would be having our paper rejected from an important journal, a stressful life event can be upsetting. And we also know that if it's a serious enough life event, that may lead to an episode of depression. But what you may not be so familiar with is the fact that that relationship has a fairly specific uh, temporal relationship. In other words, it seems to be the case that if it's causal, the episode of depression will happen within about three months of the event. That's to say, if you come to me, say you're depressed, and I take a, a history from you and find out that you've been rejected from nature a year ago, I'm not going to hold that event uh, responsible for your episode of depression. But there's another set of life events which happen early in life which have a very different relationship. So probably the worst thing that can happen, childhood sexual abuse, leads to a lifelong risk for major depression. And in fact, what we see is multiple episodes of depression occurring throughout the person's life. And again, there's good evidence to suggest that's a causal relationship, but clearly that cannot have the same etiology as the single stressful life event that I've given to you in the, in, as the first example. So those are two pieces of evidence just to make you realize that we're almost certainly dealing with a heterogeneous phenomenon. And about seven or eight years ago, when I started work on this project uh, together, together with uh, my colleague Ken Kendler, we decided to design a study which would essentially rule out known causes of heterogeneity and include as much information as we could so that we could uh, include measures that would allow us to parcel out the, uh, the, the likely sources of heterogeneity. So we set up a study called the Converge study where we set out to collect 6,000 cases and 6,000 controls. Women only for the reasons that you'll guess uh, from the slide I've shown you before, namely that the genetic effects uh, are different in men and women. And we went for recurrent depression, again, because of evidence suggesting that there are differences in the etiology. And then, as I've said, we collected a large number of risk factors for, for, uh, for depression, for all of the known or putative risk factors, including personality and, uh, and other um, environmental effects. And we did this in, in China because he has a large population and because he has a very good set of uh, hospitals, well-trained doctors, so that we could train doctors uh, not using just um, um, social workers or uh, um, we could actually have fully trained doctors to, to get this information for us. So we have a very detailed set of, uh, of data and I'll just cut very quickly to what we did which was to carry out a genome-wide association study and show you briefly this is our main result. So for those of you not familiar with reading these, these figures, the vertical axis is the likelihood of association between a genetic variant and on the horizontal axis laid out there are all the chromosomes. And each of those little dots represents the results from a single variant that's been tested. And the red line is a significant threshold. And there are two places in the genome that exceeded that threshold, which we were able to replicate. 
So that's very briefly our study, and that's very briefly our genetic result. And I now want to turn for the rest of this talk to showing you, using these data, that depression is not one disease. And I'm going to do that in two ways. I'm going to start by showing you genetic differences when we categorize by severity, and then looking at the etiology. So severity of depression is not so easy. Is it the number of episodes? But if it's the number, then if someone has one episode that lasts a year, does that count as much as 10 episodes that last one week? Is it the number of symptoms? There are problems in how you categorize this. But what we've used is a very old categorization, melancholia. And we applied a genetic mapping strategy to this. And here are the results for that. So again, it's just like what you've seen before, uh, a genome-wide association study with a significant threshold. And you can see that, that there are, uh, this is the, the, the uh, uh, figure I showed you before, and below is the one for melancholia. And if you compare the two, you can see there's a difference. That the, the locus on chromosome 10 seems to have changed. So our first question was, is that actually a significant change? And the way we address that is by taking uh, a random set of samples uh, equal in size to the number of cases of melancholia. So there's 4,500 cases of melancholia. We randomly select those, rerun the analysis, and see how often we get a result similar to that shown here. And I'm showing you here the, uh, 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 the distribution of effects from the random sample that we collected. On the right-hand side is the red line indicating what we found in our sample. And that allows us to assign a probability, and we can see that the probability is about 0.01. In other words, it's unlikely that we had seen that by chance. In other words, the change that we observe between these two figures is indeed significant. So there is a change in the genetic signal according to the, to the degree of disease. That suggests to us, therefore, that severity, at least indexed by melancholia, does pick up a difference in the genetic basis of the condition. So we wanted to push this a little bit further, and I've talked to you about the environmental causes and I want to push this a little bit more by just introducing you to, to two of the, uh, of the risk factors that we looked at. So I mentioned to you that childhood sexual abuse is, a, is a, um, a, a major risk factor. In fact, of all of the risk factors we know, this is the thing that has m most potency uh, throughout life. For uh, the most severe form, you can see the odds ratio here is above 10. What I'm showing you here are our data. These uh, are backed up by, um, from, uh, from, from many other sources. And the important thing to note is that the odds ratio, that's the increase in risk if you've had this condition, goes up according to the severity of the illness, consistent with this being, being causal. And the other set of data we collected were a more general measure of stressful life events. Those are listed on, on the left here. And again, I'm giving you the, the, uh, the odds ratios on the far right-hand side. And again, note that these vary, and the, the degree of variation, again, corresponds at least to the, um, the, uh, the measure of the, the severity of the stressful life event, consistent, with it, again, with these being causal. So we have a lot of information uh, on risk factors. And the question we asked was, is it possible that in this group there are some people who are depressed because they've had very bad things happening to them as against having a genetic predisposition. So we asked the following question, what would happen if we remove the subjects who have experienced stress? What would we see in terms of the genetic signal? Now, standard teaching is, many of you may have come across this idea, something called gene by environment interaction. That's to say you need a gene and you should have the environment in order to see a genetic effect. So this approach of taking subjects out was uh, a little counterintuitive to start with, but because we'd seen it work with melancholia, we thought we'd, we'd, we'd try this. And here are the results. So again, this is just like the, uh, the um, uh, genome-wide association plot I so showed you earlier. And for comparison's sake, I'm going to go back and show you our, our result for major depression. So the major depression one is at the top, and the one at the bottom is where we've taken out samples. And it's pretty clear there are differences here. So we're, we've lost some signals and we've gained new ones. Note, importantly, that our sample size is much reduced. So it's counterintuitive to many that if you reduce a sample, you should actually see an increase in the genetic signal, except under the model of heterogeneity. That's to say, if a large proportion of our cases are in fact driven to depression by their 
by their uh, genetic susceptibility. And again, we can ask the same question as to whether this is a, uh, a chance event by randomly selecting a subsample and seeing whether these changes are due to chance. And I'll show you that result briefly, and indeed uh, they're not. So we, we can be pretty certain that this is indeed a real difference. So now we're picking up a subgroup of people whose genetic predisposition appears to be different. But in so doing, we've really only identified three positions, three or possibly four, that make that difference. What about the rest of the genome? Is there some way that we can get access to the rest of that information? And there is, and I'll briefly show you how we do that. And to do so, I'll have to introduce you to this figure. It's called a quantile-quantile plot, where we plot out all the results that we get and compare them between uh, compare them with those we'd expect under a null distribution of no effect. And I'm showing you here uh, 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 some simulated data which shows on the uh, horizontal axis the, the null results and on the vertical axis the, the real results. And now I'll show you what we get from uh, our, our depression study. And you can see there's a shift to the left consistent with there being a genetic effect for depression. Now the question is, does that picture on the left look the same when we remove the people who have got uh, stress, and, and you can see that's not the case. So it's not just a question of the topmost signal being deviated, the stuff further down the list, which is also deviated, consistent with this genetic signal being disseminated throughout the gen genome. In other words, it's not just a question of three or four spots in the genome. There's more going on that we can't yet resolve because we don't have the sample size. And finally, we can look at this in, in another way, which is to ask very simply, is the heritability of depression with and without stressful life events the same? And I'll show you that result in the next slide. So the heritability from our data of depression, this is estimated from the, from the uh, markers that we've got, is about 21%. And if we take out those who've experienced a stressful life event, that does indeed go up to about 27%. Though that is not a significant difference, I should, I should emphasize. So finally, let's just look at what the underlying biology might be. Now, I'll hesitate to draw too many conclusions from this. When we do a genetic study, we're chasing genetic variants. We're not chasing genes. And the relationship between the two is not straightforward. But with that proviso, I'll show you the three loci that we find that are uh, in our patients who have depression but not stressful life events. And the signals... Uh, are as typically found either lying within the introns or intergenic regions. But if we take the nearest gene, which is a, a reasonable, though as I've said, unlikely to be always true metric of what is the correct gene, we find the following. There's a gene called Sirtuin 1, which is involved in mitochondrial biogenesis, LPGAT1, an enzyme localized to the inner mitochondrial membrane, and a, a solid transport which is mitochondrial ion transport. That seemed to us too much of a coincidence to be ignored. And there's one other piece of data that we obtained. So we're now looking at the mitochondrion. Our data was generated by sequencing our subjects. And when we sequence our subjects, not only do we sequence the nuclear DNA, we also sequence the DNA that's contained in the mitochondrion. And what we discovered when we did so was that there was a small but highly significant difference in the amount of mitochondrial DNA between cases and controls. We don't fully understand what this means, uh, but it does suggest to us that there may be a mitochondrial origin to at least a proportion of the cause of depression in our sample. So just to summarize what I've told you, I've given you evidence for heterogeneity in the etiology of major depression. I've shown you that there are different genetic loci that contribute to depression in those with and without stress. I've shown you that with three pieces of information, location of significant loci, an increase in the genetic signal at those loci, and an increase in the heritability. And I've argued that potentially there's a mitochondrial origin based on the fact that we have some loci that point to not proven, genes involved with mitochondrial function, and that we have evidence that cases have more mitochondrial DNA than controls. So I'd like to thank all my con collaborators in China. This is a big project involving over 60 hospitals. And uh, my uh, close collaborator, um, 
uh, Ken Kendler, who's actually in uh, Richmond in VCU, not very far away from here. So thank you for your attention, and I can take questions. Thank you, Jonathan. We have time for a question or two. Uh, please stand. Hi, it's difficult to stand with this uh, computer in my lab. Okay. Uh, my name is Eero Kastren, I'm from Finland. Very interesting data. I was wondering now, you showed actually uh, the mitochondrial uh, contribution in the non-stressed cases. And uh, uh, you might imagine that, that you know, the, the stress is involving also energy metabolism, so could actually be also even more uh, uh, severe in the cases where you do have a depression, uh, a stress in depression. Did you actually look at that, uh, the big database, also in the same way, whether the, there might be a mitochondrial well, involvement? Sorry, so there are two things I've shown. One is the change in the amount of mitochondrial DNA, and the second thing is that there is genetic data from the autosomal loci possibly implicating mitochondrial genes. Which are you talking about, the mitochondrial DNA or the Mitochondrial genes? DNA, for example, yes. Okay, so the, so the relationship between mitochondrial DNA and case status is complicated and we don't understand it. I can tell you the following. We find that there is an association between it and stress, but this, is, this was odd because all of our stress measures are things that happened to our subject a long time ago. When we did this study, this is a genetic study, and geneticists always think about lifetime. They never think about present state. We're not really concerned with that. We're separating out state from trait. So, so we have measures from th of things that happened a long time ago for people. And why would that be related to their current amount of mitochondrial DNA? That didn't make much sense. We carried out experiments in animals, in mice, where we stressed the animals, and we could show clearly that if you did stress an animal, you altered the amount of mitochondrial DNA, but we also showed quite clearly that was dynamic. In other words, you remove the stress and it goes down again. So there is some relationship here. Because we didn't have state measures, I don't know whether the changes we're seeing in our patients represent their state when they were assessed, or whether it represents something of a more uh, um, long, long running nature. Do you know uh, how long, <clears throat> when you remove a stress, it takes? Do you see the change? In the yes, we do. So, so the time course is, is intriguing. It's about two weeks before we see anything, uh, and then it takes about two weeks for it to go away, which, as you know, is about the same amount of time that it takes for an antidepressant to have an effect. That's fascinating. Okay, uh, another question right there. Uh, Brian, bring the mic to him. Kai came from a Korean clinic. Uh, uh, did your study, uh, uh, the uh, study subjects, uh, treatment naive, or they were receiving treatment? So all of our subjects are recruited in hospitals. They're all receiving some form of tr treatment, but that does mean in about 20% of cases it's Chinese traditional medicine. So a proportion of them, about 10 or 15%, I think, were not receiving any antidepressants. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.